you dream of a classroom where learning is natural? Can we inspire students to lifelong learning? What exactly is the purpose of an education? Inspiring students to be curious, independent, creative, innovative, deep thinking, confident, proactive, collaborative, determined, educated. Rise to the challenge of changing the world. This is teaching. This is learning. This is who we are. Welcome to the Tabletop Inventing Podcast. What kind of company gets started on a road trip? In the podcasting world, what is a double ender? And how does a bootstrapped U.S. startup company get connected with a startup incubator in Chile? Listen in for the engagingly clear answers in today's podcast. Hey there, Innovation Nation. Today's guests have a fascinating story. If you've ever thought about starting a company in your spare time, or if you've had an idea for a company in the strangest place, you'll find some kindred spirits on today's show. Innovation has nothing to do with how many R&D dollars you have. When Apple came up with the Mac, IBM was spending at least 100 times more on R&D. It's not about the money. It's about the people you have, how you're led, and how much you get it. These words from Steve Jobs underline the fact that innovation is driven not by money or even other technology, but by people. Creative, observant humans are the engine of innovation. It is easy in our tech-filled world to equate new tech breakthroughs with underlying technological infrastructure. But in reality, while currently available technology does enable future technologies, the future begins with a dream in the heart of a person. In the late 1960s, Gene Roddenberry had a dream. This dream was turned into a television show we all know as Star Trek. In this fictional future, the crew of the USS Enterprise used a device called a tricorder. This device had the capability of reading information from its surroundings, geolocating the user, taking chemical, biological, and physical data, along with connecting the user to the computer in the sky aboard the USS Enterprise for analysis. Today, the tricorder has largely become a reality in the smartphone and its supporting technologies. We are connected to the computer in the sky via our cell signals and Wi-Fi. We can geolocate ourselves using the GPS features on our phone. We can take a photo of an object and the computer in the cloud can tell us what that object is, what it can be used for and its other physical, chemical and or biological properties. With appropriate add-ons, these devices are now also monitoring our health, connecting us to the electronics back at home, and allowing us to track other humans on the planet via their GPS signals. It can easily be argued that the smartphone and many of its supporting technologies began as an idea in Gene Roddenberry's creative imaginings. So here at Tabletop Inventing, we spend the bulk of our time investing in the inspiration of creativity in teenagers. We know that by feeding their fanciful imagination and then putting tools in their hands to begin exploring the possibilities, a new generation of innovators will arise quite naturally. Just the other day, some students in our Inventor Bootcamp learned that hobby-grade quad-rotor technology could be used to lift a person off the ground. Now, I don't know exactly what they will do with that knowledge as time goes on, but they are already discussing how they can improve their own DIY quadrotor project. Perhaps they will invent an improved hoverboard like the one I saw just this week in a video. To find out more about Inventors Bootcamp, visit inventingzone.com. Speaking of innovation, today's guests are quite familiar with the development of game-changing technology. Spencer Handley, Hannah Russell Goodson, and Josh Lankford recently started a small company called PodClear. Their technology is already revolutionizing how I am conducting podcast interviews. So my guests today are Hannah Russell Goodson and Spencer Handley and Josh Lankford, in no particular order. These three 
amazing individuals have created a new podcasting utility. They've done some really cool stuff for, for us podcasters that solves some major internet issues, I guess is probably the best way to put it. And I will let them tell you a little more about their story. But first, let me give a little bit of an introduction to this. PodClear is an application that records on both ends of a conversation so that if we are sitting on opposite sides of the world and we have a suddenly have an internet glitch and my audio on my side where I'm recording is bad, PodClear is still recording on the other side of the world and I don't get a glitch in my audio. So for podcasters, this is one of those applications that we have just been dying for for quite a while. And these guys have totally bootstrapped their company. I think that's amazing. And recently they've been talking to a business incubator in Chile and that's Chile in South America. And I think that is the coolest thing I've heard in a while. And to top all this off, like no kidding, just out of the, like by accident, I didn't know this until we talked a couple of minutes ago. Hannah has worked until very recently in experiential education. So tell us a little more about how this whole PodClear thing got started. So this is Hannah. Um, and just a little background on how I got started. It was a little bit of an accident, actually. Spencer and I were on a road trip and listening to tons of podcasts. It's just a really incredible way to spend some time, especially when you're on a long trip. Um, but there are so many cool educational podcasts out there and great storytelling podcasts. So we spend a lot of time listening to them in our spare time. Um, and on this road trip, we had downloaded just hours and hours of podcasts to make the long drive from San Francisco to L.A. And in that time, we were listening to a lot of Skype interviews that were taking place. And while the content was really interesting, there were a few times we really had to just turn it off because the audio was absolutely atrocious. And we were sitting there kind of going back and forth and thinking, like, why, why haven't they taken care of this yet? I feel like the end of 2014, we have so many cool pieces of technology, and this just doesn't seem to be a thing that people have fully solved for yet. So Spencer and Josh are both incredible engineers, and so they kind of came at it from a technical perspective, and I came at it from just like a user perspective and from a listener perspective of what would actually sound the best and might be easiest to use. And so we started working together to just kind of hammer out a basic idea of what this might look like and build a prototype. And we found out in some of our research that this is a problem that a lot of podcasters and broadcasters really struggle with and are already kind of finding workaround solutions for, but we wanted to make something that was just dead simple to use and could really just make sure that content was coming through loud and clear and that people weren't missing out on really great stories or great educational pieces just because it was so unbearable to listen to. So that's kind of where we're coming at it from. So I can't help it. I'm the tech guy here. What was the first technical problem you jumped on or what was the first couple of ideas and how did you kind of get to where you are now? Uh, this is Spencer. So Josh and I are the engineers on the project and some of the first like early technical hurdles Obviously, the solution is exactly as you described sort of earlier in the conversation. It automates something called a double ender, which is like a recording practice that podcasters do where essentially because Skype connections tend to be pretty inconsistent. A good example is this conversation, like we're connected via Skype right now uh, and PodClear is recording on the side. But a lot of this conversation has been broken up on my end. And had I been recording, that would have been a permanent part of our podcast, uh, which would be a shame. So basically what a double ender is, and this is something that people have been doing for a while, even back to the days of like tape recordings for radio stations is both sides of the conversation would be recording independently using some sort of recording software. In this case, it would be like Audacity or something like that. They would get a full length recording and then they would save that file, upload it to Dropbox, send it the email. The other person would sort of download the file and sync it up manually and then sort of try and sync the file so that there was no drift in the files and all that stuff. And it's this really laborious process. It's just kind of a pain in the butt. And previously, I mean, we've even heard some users who have been in radio for so long that they remember the days of doing a double ender with tape where they would literally <laughs> tape on one side, tape on the other. They package up the tape and FedEx it to their guest or their host. And then the host would literally sync the tape in like an analog system, which is insane. So PodClear kind of does all of that automatically. But to answer your question about technical hurdles first thing is sort of uh, how do you facilitate quick syncing with recording so like when you as the host sort of invite a guest how do you make sure that like the recording stay in sync how do i make it easy for the, the guests themselves to get the software and how do we make it work on all platforms you know we could go on forever about the different technical hurdles involved in making this thing work and we're still sort of facing a lot of those issues to, to this day but it's certainly like a tricky engineering problem which is fun 
Well, I think it's nice that the process is automated because as a podcaster, usually that's something that you do in addition to all the rest of the stuff you do in your business. I mean, there are a few podcasters out there that that's what they do is they podcast. Even John Dumas, who, I mean, I don't even know how he keeps up with his schedule, but even he does other stuff. So the easier the podcast is to record and master and turn into a nice audio file, the easier it is for us in the field here. And so what I like is that PodClear just does most of that, kind of like the Macintosh. It just it just does it. It just works. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, we're trying to make it as streamlined and simple as possible so that you can focus on the content. I mean, earlier you were saying, like, the most interesting part for you is, you know, not being the audiophile, but really just being the person who tells the stories and interviews interesting folks. And, you know, that's what you're passionate. You're not passionate about getting your host to like or your guests to upload their files, all that stuff. That's sort of just a byproduct of something you have to do just to get the audio. And it's, it's annoying. So if we can make it simple, then that's doing something pretty awesome for podcasters. Well, it's interesting you mentioned that because just last week I had another friend of mine and he and I actually did that. He recorded his side and I recorded my side. And, you know, I'm going to have our AV person blend those two files and, and catch them. Yeah. And we're actually testing PodClear right now. This is really cool, actually, that we're interviewing the PodClear guys on our first podcast using PodClear, which is awesome. Yeah. Uh, there's some sort of weird symmetry about that. And about a month and a half ago, I interviewed three other people and we had to pass the mics back and forth. So there's going to be a lot of cutting out of the audio on that one as we kind of pass the microphones back and forth and make sure that this is connected and that person is just recorded. And yeah, it, this just yeah. makes us so much nicer. So let's back up a little further now. How did you guys get into the car and have this conversation in the first place? I mean, have you guys known each other for a long time? Did you just, is this a business trip? How did that happen? And what was your education maybe leading up to this? Like, how did that conversation occur? Like, what was the backstory? The backstory is we've always been podcast listeners. And so we've always been sort of aware of, one, the fact that most podcasts are this format, interview-based. So sort of knowing the main pain points, we'd all sort of wanted to start some sort of a project to get together. And during this road trip, I think it had been like a couple of months long. We were sort of always passing ideas back and forth like, oh, wouldn't it be cool to make this thing or maybe this thing? And, and this idea while we were sort of driving up from Los Angeles was like, oh, you know, that's like a legitimate pain point. I don't know of a solution. And it's clearly affecting not only just the podcaster, but like us as the listener, like the podcast we were listening to when we came up with the idea was super fascinating, but we actually had to turn it off because it was impossible to hear the guests. It was just more frustrating, right? It was affecting people who were trying to consume this content and sort of self-educate through podcasts. So if we could write a piece of software that could be potentially kind of simple to implement, it could have a pretty cool impact. So yeah, that's sort of the backstory on that. Now, you two are engineers and Hannah is a salesperson. How did you guys meet? So Josh and Spencer went to a school together called Hack Reactor. So it's kind of an accelerated computer science JavaScript engineering school that just kind of moves you from like 60 to 120. So they already had some coding skills and this was just like a three month intensive. And so they were already working on a lot of other cool projects together and knew that they worked well and passed ideas well between each other and had kind of a solid foundation skill set that they knew they could work. And Spencer and I had actually met, I guess it's like two and a half, almost three years ago now, actually traveling. And so we met traveling in Southeast Asia and spent some time traveling around there together. And then we're both kind of doing our own thing, but kept in touch for a while, just talking about interesting ideas we had, books we had read, things that we were doing. And when we were both back in San Francisco, kind of reconnected. So I'm curious how you came from experiential education into this, or maybe they're not related. Help us understand that connection. They seem a little tangentially related, maybe, but I've been doing experiential education in Southern California for about three years when I moved to San Francisco. I mean, I actually moved to San Francisco after a long bike trip and was feeling just kind of ready after sleeping in a new location every night, living off my bike, to having an apartment and maybe starting a project. So I think as an educator, I feel like we're always, especially in experiential education, the focus is always on letting students try new things and just start projects, kind of like we talked about earlier in our conversation, how um, just because you have a background and education in one specific topic, that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be propelled forward to do that specific thing. And a lot of what we teach in experiential education is about just like jumping into new, uncomfortable sometimes situations and finding a place where you can 
thrive within that uncomfortable situation. And so I guess I wanted a little bit of a challenge for myself. I loved what I was doing before, um, but I was also feeling curious about pursuing a different path and learning some new skills. So coming into San Francisco, the tech industry here is obviously huge. I also joined a women's social entrepreneurship group, which is a group of really incredible women and just kind of fostering that new community for myself. This seemed like something that would be a really good opportunity to learn about engaging a community, learn about building a product. It's in a space that I really care about. So I guess I was just taking my own advice in a way as an educator and jumping into a new space that made me a little bit uncomfortable, but was something I thought I could do and would be an interesting learning experience. So when did the leap happen for you guys between it being an idea and starting to do something about it? What prompted you to make that jump? I think basically what we did when the idea sort of came to mind is we sort of sat down and thought about how it would be implemented and what, like, did a little bit of research. Hannah put together a little like Google spreadsheet like form uh, and put it out on some forums that where podcasters sort of go to get information. And then basically the forum just asks like, hey, uh, how do you record? What are the main pain points in your podcasting process? Anyway, we got about 30 responses to that, and people's feedback was overall like sort of positive. And uh, that sort of proved to us that it might be worth building a prototype of. So it was very shortly after we came up with the idea, we were like, all right, let's spend the next few weeks writing a basic version of what we're imagining here, and then throw up a landing page to see if we can get some people to sign up as beta users. And then you know the response from that was very positive. And we put it up on some blogs, like uh, there's one called Beta List which basically allows you to put up a landing page with just an idea and no clear, like not an actual product uh, available for download. And people who are interested can go in and uh, put their email in and tell you, hey, like when this is ready, if, if you actually make it, I would like to use it. And we got a few hundred people interested from that. And it sort of uh, propelled us forward to continue building it and then actually get it out the door to, uh, at the time, 700 beta users got access to the, the early version of the software. And and helped us sort of bug test and also gave us feedback on what would be the most uh, critical features in the software. So you guys got to the beta phase with 700 users. How did you get introduced to an incubator in Chile? Like that just, <laughs> I'm not making the leap here. How, how, did you, how did you meet them? So I had heard about Startup Chile a couple years ago from other entrepreneurial friends. And uh, it was just something on the back of our mind. So when we started kind of getting a little bit more momentum, we we're like, oh, maybe we should, you know, we, we all work side jobs uh, right now just to pay for rent and food and all that stuff. So we're like, oh, maybe we should try and get into an incubator so we could focus on this a little bit more full time and not have these other sort of life distractions. So we were, we sort of like listed out the ones that we would want to get into. And we applied to some like more ambitious incubators and they were like, well, Startup Chile seems really cool. They don't take any equity, but they give you money and enough to like live on and you get to experience a different country for a while, which is something we all want to do. And so it seemed like a great option. And we just dropped an application in, waited like two or three months. And then I think it was like three weeks ago, we finally got the acceptance letter. So we'll be joining just over 90 other companies from from 25 different countries for seven months down in Santiago. It should be really cool. So this is like a tech incubator in Santiago? Correct, yeah. But it functions a little bit non-traditionally. Typically, incubators, the way that they sustain themselves is through gaining equity in early stage companies with the hopes that maybe those companies will have a win later on. And then you know the money off of that win will fuel and perpetuate the incubator itself. In this case, with Startup Chile, what's interesting about them is it's government funded, and the intention is not to sort of make some private equity investors very wealthy. It's to sort of spur the entrepreneurial and creative spirits in a city. So what they're doing is it's equity-free money, but what they want you to do is come to the city as an entrepreneur with some background in like <laughs> you know technology or entrepreneurship, and then teach courses. Hannah is going to go and teach courses on leadership and education. Josh and I might teach things on uh, software engineering or programming, and so they want to bring that knowledge base to uh, Santiago itself. So that's that's what they're getting out of it. It's, it's super interesting. So it, and it's a great opportunity for us as a bootstrapped startup. It's really a, a wonderful opportunity. I think it's exciting for us as well to be able to potentially, we want to make an impact in the podcasting world, obviously, and really work and focus on our product, but also it's a cool opportunity for us to make an impact in another location and to reach out to another community and just be involved in more learning in that capacity.
I was going to ask you about that, Hannah, about the social entrepreneurship, because you mentioned that you were part of a women's social entrepreneurship group, and this seems to match that really, really well. Yeah, I think it's one of the things I'm more excited about with, I mean, I'm very excited about having a chance to work on PodClear full time and not have to have a distraction to another job. But I think it'll also give us a chance to connect with another community. And I think it fits in really well with potentially creating other things and having the experience to create other things that will be beneficial either to the community in Santiago or give me a little bit of an insight into how people from 25 different countries, there are different ways that things are successful across the world. And sometimes the implementation that you need to take to make something successful somewhere else or to help people in a different part of the world, you really need to learn about that and you need to be present and you need to be willing to learn from them. So I think that'll be a really cool kickoff for me to be able to just listen to the people in that community and listen to people from communities all over the world to see how people are solving problems in different locations. Yeah, I think that's very interesting. Well, we are, I don't want to take the podcast for too long, and this is just about the right time for us to shift toward education a little bit. I want to ask you guys to think back over your life and the different experiences, educational experiences you've had. And I'm not going to put a qualifier on that. That doesn't have to be necessarily a formal education. It could be something informal. And we're going to start with Josh. So tell us a little bit about your educational experience, things that stick out, maybe teachers that stick out, maybe a mentor that sticks out. Tell us about your educational experience that brought you up to the point of starting PodClear. Yeah, I don't have a lot of traditional education uh, in the sense of a big university or anything like that, but I had some good educational experiences you mentioned. So earlier, Hannah mentioned Hack Reactor, uh, which is where Spencer and I met, uh, which is a, a three-month intensive CS program. So basically the way that works is you go there and you spend about 14 hours a day learning CS concepts and, and just programming, right? One of the great things about that program is that you're surrounded by a cohort of, of other individuals that are doing the same course as you who also have the exact same tribe that you do. Um, I find that educational experiences are usually really good when you're surrounded by other people who have the exact same intentions that you do. I've noticed in other educational <laughs> situations in my life, high school, middle school, community college, that I was surrounded by people, not entirely, but you're surrounded by other people who aren't quite as interested in the thing that you're doing or the thing that you're currently focused on, which tends to bring your drive down, or at least in my case, it brings my drive down. Being surrounded by other people who are interested and excited to learn the, like the topic really kind of just propels me forward. I have never thought about education like that, but you're exactly right. We do that in our inventors boot camp classes, and the students are there because they want to be, and there's this tremendous energy that gets generated. And I've only had that occur in a few other places, a few other times in my life. That's fascinating. What do you guys think? Have you guys had similar experiences to that? Absolutely. You know, especially in situations like uh, Hack Reactor or other non-traditional forms of education, the community pretty much drives the entire experience. And uh, oftentimes in those situations, like Hack Reactor specifically, I feel like the curriculum was fantastic. And the systems that they've built to sort of implant this skill, and in this case, 80 individuals' minds, is fantastic. There's a lot of science behind it. But in my case, speaking for myself specifically, I feel like I learned more from my classmates than I did from the program itself. Because while the program's going on, everyone's exploring new concepts and things outside of the curriculum. And and you get excited about that. And then, you know, the community aspect propels your education, like Josh said, uh, exponentially, which is awesome. Well, no pressure here, Hannah. In this environment where you have other individuals kind of pushing you forward, it isn't possible for the teacher to reach out and touch every single individual all the time. But the, the idea that was just mentioned about self-teaching or teaching each other, have you noticed that in any of the experiential forums where you've had experience? I mean, absolutely. I think it's key. I think... As a teacher, you're obviously going to have moments where you do connect one on one. But like you said, it's impossible to do it all the time. Like the amount of bandwidth you have as one individual, you, know, you can only spend so much individual time with each student. But I think that what we really try to cultivate in an experiential education environment is that you become kind of like Josh said, a little bit of a tribe. Like you teach compassion, you teach good communication skills, you teach leadership. 
you teach vulnerability, you teach critical thinking skills. And if you can teach those to everyone, then everyone within that group becomes a little bit of a teacher. And then they can rely on each other as a group. And it's not always looking to you, what do we do next? What are we doing tomorrow? How do we get solve this problem? They look to each other to help each other solve problems. They're able to take a leadership role. And I think that that is absolutely critical as a teacher to inspire your students to look to the world to teach them and look to each other to learn new things. And I think that's really what education should be about, is that everything in the world is interesting and can teach you something if you're only willing to look for it and if you're willing to work for it a little bit. So I think creating it's a also, community of people who are good learners is really important. It's also interesting to spin off of that idea, like the idea of being audacious enough to consider yourself a thought leader amongst your peers is super powerful, right? Because like every author out there who's ever uh, written anything influential at some point had to make the decision that they were credible enough and knew enough about a certain topic that they could teach others. And I'm sure that imposter syndrome sets in heavy when anyone sits down to write a book or, or whatever, put content out in the world that's intended to be consumed and educate others. And to feel like you can do that within your own community, like you know enough about a certain topic that you can teach someone else and not feel, I don't know, not feel like feel confident about that is probably one of the most important parts of building this tribe where it's sort of mutually educational for everyone involved. Those are some powerful ideas that all of you guys have mentioned, actually, the idea of a community that drives the energy of the educational environment and that the students are actually teaching each other and that the confidence rises as you start to get competence. Those are just powerful tools, and we've observed that also. We work with teenagers, and each of those things are things that we try to bring up in our educational experiences, and it's very validating to hear you guys say those things. You know, because you always wonder, does that really make a difference? <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Hopefully, I, I think it does. Spencer and I were actually talking about some education related things last night, and we were thinking back to when we were a bit younger and sort of being disappointed in ourselves for wasting time that we could have spent learning. We were just sort of like rattling off things we want to learn. We're both interested in speed cubing, which is just like the act of solving a Rubik's Cube at high speed. I was talking about learning guitar. Um, we were just basically just throwing out things that we wished we had spent time learning when we were younger because we don't have time to currently do those things. <laughs> so hopefully a community aspect is, is taking play around your education system and people are just getting excited about learning new things. What's also interesting, we were talking about this last night, too, is like a solid education isn't necessarily an education in a particular topic, but rather an education in how to self-educate. That's probably the central theme in education is like you go to school and study one particular discipline. But really what you're learning is how to wrap your mind around a concept or how to attain a skill. And hopefully the principles that you acquire in that process can be applied to other disciplines because you're only gonna be in an educational environment where it's institutionalized for you know a few years in your early life. But if you learn those principles and apply them forever, you could feasibly become like a master or really, really skilled or knowledgeable in a lot of different fields over, over the course of your lifetime, which is pretty cool. I think we said the way we phrased it last night, Spencer, was building a framework, like an education framework for yourself and finding out how you learn and which things are beneficial, and which things are detrimental to like your learning process. And I think if you can figure that out at a younger age, then you'd be much better off. So you guys have actually anticipated both of the questions I always ask in the podcast and just <laughs> naturally went there. So I'm going to explicitly say them and ask you to maybe give the answer with a bow on top for each of them. So the first question that we always ask coming up to the end of the podcast is in context of the digital age. I mean, now we have almost 600 billion websites out there. Mm -hmm. you, know, you can just Google something and the 600 million places might have your answer. You can go to mm -hmm. Wikipedia. I mean, who would have imagined back in the days of you know, Encyclopedia Britannica that people would create a free encyclopedia by volunteering their time? I mean, that just is a ridiculous idea. And so all of that is out there. And with that context, with that backdrop, what does it mean to be, quote, educated? Like, what does that word educated mean in today? It's an interesting question. I think, go ahead, Josh. I was going to say, I think that sort of goes back to the conversation we were just having, right? And Spencer and I were saying, you know, kind of reliving in a previous conversation, but the way we had talked about it was, you know, building a framework for 
for learning, sort of getting that down is sort of the way that I would describe being educated, right? If you're able to kind of focus on a topic and get yourself up to speed with that in a relatively short amount of time, then I think you can consider yourself an educated person because there's so much information available, because it's so fast. You don't necessarily need to memorize things. I was just saying that I think it's also cool to know that because we have all of this access and connection, not only to information, but also to reaching so many people and to creating new platforms or new applications or new ways of thinking that we can spread quickly around the world. I think that nowadays to be educated, I think there's certainly something to be said for just having a masterful amount of knowledge about something, you know, really going in depth. I think often today, because we can just look stuff up on Google, we might have a surface knowledge of thousands and thousands of things, but not necessarily a depth of knowledge to very many of those things. So maybe going a little bit deeper and then also making a difference with that knowledge. So we have access to reach so many people. So if you can take that education and then do something with it. So we all have the power to make an impact in a much larger way now that we're so readily connected. But I think to learn about something and then to make a positive change in that direction. I think that people who I really respect who are well educated are then using that knowledge, not just for the joy of knowing it, even though that's wonderful, but then to, yeah, make a change, do something with it. Those are beautiful yeah. answers. Go ahead. It's totally true. So uh, there's a few things too. So tr in traditional education, I think one of the things that gets left out a lot of times is this sort of the love of the epiphany, like the epiphany euphoria, when you like learn something new and your all your neurons are firing and you're just like so excited that something finally clicks for you. And that's not necessarily cherished all that much. It's like it's a lot of sort of hitting milestones and getting good grades, but less so about like, hey, listen to this incredible information and feel how it is internally to conceptualize and like what it, what, what it feels like as a human being to like now know something that you didn't previously know. It's really an exciting feeling. And going back to what Hannah was saying, like the things that it unlocks for you, if you learn something new, a new skill or new information about how the world works, it's not only exciting and you don't only get that epiphany for you, you also get a, a tool, right? It's like a, it's a seeing education as like the more knowledge you acquire, the more you can do in this life uh, is, is a pretty powerful part about being educated in general. And I, and I would argue that like, if you could be educated without knowing anything in particular, but having that zest for knowledge and being hungry for learning new things and, and hungry for finding those epiphanies and understanding the world more deeply. I wanted to touch on one other thing. I was listening to a podcast with this guy named Josh Waitkins and or Waitskin is his last name. Anyway, he's the guy who the film Searching for Bobby Fisher was based on. Uh, so he's this incredible individual. He was like a chess prodigy. And now I believe he's diving deep into martial arts. And he's written a bunch of books on the sort of subject of mastery and attaining skills and knowledge. And he's just incredibly brilliant, self-educated man. And what he was talking about is sort of similar to what Hannah was saying, like this problem with modernity in that we have so much access to knowledge, but the problem is, you know, we have so much access to knowledge. So you get a lot of sort of ADD tendencies where you're like, oh, I want to learn this thing. And you're, you're getting these quick hits of of excitement because you're like, oh, this is a new topic, this is a new topic, this is a new topic, but you lose this sort of drill down depth that previously I feel like people would pursue a little bit more fervently. Like before the 20th century, people had apprenticeships where they would study one topic for seven years and then that would be their profession and they would be the master at that. I don't think that happens as frequently nowadays. And I don't know, I can't make a fair assessment on whether or not that's a good thing. I think there's parts of it that are really exciting. Like everyone is sort of the the Renaissance individual where, you know, their knowledge is wide and, and sort of, I don't know, you could also say that it lacks depth, but finding some nice balance in the middle where you're actively pursuing depth in a particular subject, but still having that multidisciplinary, wide open knowledge base, I think is the sweet spot. So I like all of those answers. And I would love to actually keep this conversation going for another like three episodes because you guys are touching on all the cool things that we think about and hear from some of the best minds on our podcast. But let's wrap it up with this last question. So each of you come up with kind of your formula here as we come down to the end. What is the purpose of an education? I'll just let that sink in for just a moment because there's a lot of possibilities there. And it's okay if your answers don't agree with each other because you may not have the same purposes uh, coming at education between the three of you even. Let's start with Hannah. This is definitely a tough one, but I think ultimately 
the purpose of an education is to allow people to better the world and to better humanity. It's giving people tools and skills to make things in the world better for everyone. I think that there is an aspect of it that is, you know, it's pure joy. At least for me, there's just like, there's joy that comes along with reading a great book or having a great conversation or just like that excitement you get when you do learn a new skill. But I think the reason why there's so many institutions set up to educate people and to move them forward and to and then new types of education that people are discovering and inventing, I think all of that really comes down to how can we make this next batch of humans the best they can be so that they can move forward and yeah, keep our world a great place. How about you, Josh? What is the purpose of an education? Huge question. I agree mostly with Hannah, right? It's it's to propel humanity forward. But I think when I think about what is the purpose of education, it seems like a really grandiose thing. At least that's the first thing that comes to mind. It's like, oh, well, we need to continue to move forward as a race, you know, as humanity. So our sun's going to burn out in three billion years. And then hopefully by then we've, you know, educated ourselves enough to move into different <laughs> solar systems and we are populating the universe. So I guess that that's that's what comes to mind for me. <laughs> All right, Spencer, wrap it up. I think I think I agree. I think the purpose of education is self empowerment for the application of affecting change and impacting humanity in your own unique way. That was a beautiful, nice, tight answer. So as we wrap up here, guys, uh, what's the best way for our audience to connect with you? We have a website, which is podclear.com. If you are strictly interested in figuring out more about Podclear, if you're a podcaster, you can also reach out to us at Podclear Tweets on Twitter or any of our first names. So Josh, Spencer, or Hannah at podclear.com. And feel free to shoot us an email in regards to Podclear or in regards to anything else that you think might be interesting and want to chat with us about. Excellent. Thank you so much, guys. This was a lot of fun. Thank Appreciate you so much. It. Thanks. If you've been enjoying the conversations and insights here on the podcast, share it with a friend. Great ideas demand to be shared. You can also help fellow parents and educators by subscribing to the Tabletop Inventing podcast in iTunes, leaving a rating, and writing a review. If you use Android, subscribe, leave us a rating, and write a review in Stitcher. Links to subscribe can be found at www.ttinvent.com slash podcast. Contact us and we'll think through the comments and answer your questions here in the podcast. And be sure to let us know if you'd like a shout out or to remain anonymous. You can share your comments and questions at www.ttinvent.com slash podcast or by emailing us at podcast at ttinvent.com. Let's discuss your thoughts and questions. Join us again next time when we will again seek to answer the question, what is the purpose of an education? And as educators, how do we awaken the inventor in each of our students? Mm -hmm.